Welcome to the Interlocutor Podcast. I'm Tyrell Cameron Eskelson. My guest today is Mark Milkey. Mark is a fellow Canadian who grew up in Kelowna, British Columbia, and today lives in the city of Calgary. Over the past 25 years, Mark has published numerous columns and studies and several books. Most notable among them is a book entitled The Victim Cult, How the Culture of Blame Hurts Everyone and Wrecks Civilization. Today, Mark is founder and president of the Aristotle Foundation for Public Policy and the editor of their first book, The 1867 Project, Why Canada Should Be Cherished, Not Cancelled. Welcome, Mark, and thanks very much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me, Tyrell. So when I was a teenager, I was 19 years old, my friends and I, we went backpacking in Asia and Australia. And when we all arrived at the Saskatoon airport to depart, we all had these Canadian flags sewn onto our backpacks. And we had all done this independently of of one another. And I think we had this sense that if we, we had the sense that Canadians were decent or good people, and that if we advertised this fact that we would be treated well in the world. And I'm wondering if you grew up with a a similar sense of what it meant to be Canadian? I think so. Um, I I mean, I think part of the Canadian flag and the backpack thing historically came from Canadians trying to distinguish themselves from Americans, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. And um, my my entire PhD thesis was actually on the rhetoric of anti-Americanism in Canada because it kind of, you know, um, you know, goes in cycles. Um, it's perhaps not as great as it was uh, today as it was in the past, but, you know, it'll ramp up again at some point, and it goes from left to right politically uh, over the ages. So I was always fascinated by that. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, nonetheless, yeah, I think certainly that's a good indication of how most people viewed Canada as something worth celebrating, cherishing, um, again, the anti-American sometimes element of that aside, or the, or the, the potential snootiness of that aside, right? When we traveled around the world, uh, when I was actually in Japan, um, I remember uh, there was another fellow that was in Japan who's the author that once wrote a book about Japan. Um, I think his name is Will somebody, and I remember him in the book saying. Yeah, Canadians think they're polite and nice, but only compared to Americans, right? So we were just as boisterous, <laughs> you know, vis-a-vis the rest of the world. Anyway, um, that aside, yes, I think what your story says is that people used to, in the main, think Canada was a good place worth celebrating, worth cherishing. That has changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had grandparents that came from the Ukraine and from Poland, and they settled on the prairies, and also read an interesting story that you had a an ancestor who fought in the American Civil War and eventually came up to Saskatchewan and, and settled there. Uh, w- I guess, uh, first of all, with, with that ancestor, where do you know where he settled in, in Saskatchewan? I guess it wouldn't have been Saskatchewan at that time. Would well, it have been? yeah, Northwest Territories before it became the province of Saskatchewan, right? Um, or yeah. maybe it was Saskatchewan. So it's actually my grandfather. So yeah, I had a great or great grandfather who fought on the side of the North in the U.S. Civil War. Apparently, he came from Prussia originally. And mm-hmm. um, at some point, though, his son or grandson, and I forget, again, whether the, the person in the picture was my great-grandfather or, or great-great-grandfather. One loses track of these things. But my grandfather um, did move up to Saskatchewan from Wisconsin, I believe, in the early 1900s. And so depending on when he moved up there, and I should know the date, but I don't, Saskatchewan was either a province by 1905, um, or if he'd moved up uh, before then, he, it wasn't. It was the Northwest Territories. But that's how one part of the family came to Canada, on, and that was on my mom's side. On my dad's mm-hmm. side, basically my grandmother on that side came from Ukraine, as a German living in Ukraine, um, by 1927. Uh, and my grandfather came from Poland. He was a German living in Poland, came over in 1928 to Canada, settled in Edmonton. And there's a long story there, which I tell in a previous book. They both basically came for opportunity. They had relatives in Edmonton, said, come over here. And so they escaped the worst of the 1930s, of course, in Europe, thankfully. Mm. And uh, But yeah, that's the family history. But people came here back then thinking Canada was the land of opportunity. And I think for the most part, it still is. But what's changed, and this is why we wrote the 1867 Project, myself and 19 other authors associated with the Aerosol Foundation. We wrote the 1867 Project, Why Canada Should Be Cherished, Not Cancelled, precisely because in some quarters, and I don't think it's the majority, but it's certainly a loud 
um, portion of the population now sees Canada as what genocidal um, they see it as uh, something not to be celebrated they see it as institutionally racist these are all cliches I think um, and, and frankly you know ones we try and debunk in the book um, but that's why we wrote the 1867 project because we were in large measure concerned about the treatment of people in history which also says something about how you value Canada now so mm -hmm. um, so, for example, and I think the core problem in this view that somehow Canada is, you know, not worth celebrating is that, well, if you go back to, say, John MacDonald, right, who's often criticized these days or canceled, right, his statues are taken down and so forth. Well, if you say John MacDonald shouldn't be cherished or somehow you make the accusation that native policy of the day was genocidal, which is, um, uh, you know, hyperbole, and I disagree with it, and so does an author in the book, Greg P. S. Atsky. If you mm -hmm. say... Johnny MacDonald and his policies towards uh, Native Canadians of the day were genocidal, despite the fact that he fought with an opposition to get more funding for famine relief, despite the fact that he fought with the opposition to get more funding for smallpox vaccination among Native Canadians of the day, you know, those who we call indigenous now. If you say it was genocidal because of residential schools, despite the fact that actually treaties required residential schools and some uh, First Nations leaders demanded residential schools. If you admit all that context and try and call John A. Macdonald genocidal, you're engaging in word inflation in addition to revisionist history. And the problem with that is if everything's genocidal, then in fact nothing is, right? Um, so uh, you actually downgrade the importance of the Ukraine genocide under Stalin or certainly of course the Holocaust. So. Part of the reason we set out to write the 1867 project, uh, this book on Canada and her history, was to try and add some nuance back into the record, to add facts, and to make people think about these sorts of accusations. Because in essence, they don't allow you to celebrate Canada historically or now, of course. I mean, if we're just no better than Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, um, which did engage in genocide um, in Ukraine, if that's or mm -hmm. Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. If that's all Canada is, then certainly we can't celebrate it or cherish it. But our argument, obviously, is very different in the book that, you know, we should look at history different um, and actually be more informed about history. So uh, in the book and in, in your past uh, appearances speaking in places, you've talked about the word and concept utopian. I'm uh, wondering how you... I would define or understand that term utopian and what are the ways that utopian thinking is influencing Canadian society today? Sure, that's an ex excellent question, Tarl. So um, the reason I, were, I use the word utopian in the introduction to the 1867 project is because um, utopians in history are always a problem. Um, they, they believe in a paradise on earth, a heaven on earth, right? And they, they aim to create a heaven on earth. And there's a number of problems with that, whether it's a religious you know, conception of utopia, of heaven on earth, or say a Marxist conception in the 19th and 20th centuries, we're going to create perfect equality and a perfect society uh, where everyone is completely equal, desirable or not, possible or not. Um, when you set out to create a utopia, what you do is you ignore reality. You ignore human beings as they are in all their wonderful diversity, in the best sense of the word diversity. Right? People of all colors and creeds and desires. Some people want to be butchers. Some people want to be candlestick makers. Some people want to you know, be an entrepreneur and set up a company, what have you, or teach you know, at teach university like you do. We all have very different desires. Um, and it goes without saying, or it should go without saying, that we, you know, because we have different desires and, and desire different outcomes, we're going to have different outcomes in addition to different skill sets and aptitudes and, and the rest of it. So historically, utopianism has been a problem as applied to the future because utopia is about creating something in the future. Ironically or weirdly, now when people look back at Canadian history, we have utopians, and I think this is part of the problem. They look back at Johnny MacDonald or they look at other 19th century individuals that helped found Canada and they go, well, they weren't perfect. And therefore we can't cherish Canada uh, because you know women didn't have the vote before you know 1918. Of course, most men didn't have the vote either in the 19th century. Um, but people look back in history and go, well, that figure was imperfect. And again, you know, except for the extreme figures, you know, Hitler or Stalin, we're talking about Johnny MacDonald, we're talking about George Washington, the American context. If you really can't celebrate 
what they built. If you can't cherish what they built, what you're being is utopian. You're expecting people in history to have been perfect or to have our views today, which also assumes all of our views today are exactly similar, that we agree on everything, and that our views today are exactly where we should be, that we've arrived at utopia, uh, which of course is arrogant in the extreme. Um, so the danger of utopian thinking is not just applied to the future as it once was in Marxism and in religious communities, and therefore you crush the individual who didn't want to be part of your planned utopia. We now have it today where people look back at the past and go, well, um, you were all in, they were all imperfect and therefore we have to cancel Canada. It's a bit like looking at an oak tree and you see a diseased limb. Um, what do you do? You remove the limb and you strengthen the tree. But you don't take down the entire tree because of an imperfection. Um, mm -hmm. But that's what some people do. And that's why I call it utopian thinking, but ironically or weirdly is applied to the past. Mm. Yeah, but I, I think it's uh, a valuable or a, a interesting way to, to look at uh, what people are doing and, and how they look at the past in this way. So uh, It's also one-sided, by the way. You know, so the problem is... Of course, everybody's ancestors, you know, if you go back far enough, has a black sheep in it, so to speak, you know, or mm -hmm. there's some imperfection or there's some wrong done, right? Human, there's nine, what, nine billion human beings alive on the planet today. Even if no one wanted to do any harm to each other, even if there were no Putins on the planet, um, you would still bump into each other accidentally, right? You'd step on someone's toe or, you know, have an accident or whatever. Um, but it's utopian also because... You know, these days we, you know, we tend to romanticize indigenous peoples. And I think that's a mistake, both for their sake and ours. In British Columbian history, it was the indigenous First Nations of British Columbia that held slaves until the late 19th century when the British were trying to stamp it out. And so, you know, would you rather have been living under British rule, you know, in a community where slaves were not allowed or in a First Nations community far from, you know, the rule of law and, and the British in the late 19th century? Um, you know, it's not to pick on First Nations. I mean, slavery was pretty has been common in human history until very recently. But the point being, we shouldn't romanticize our own culture. My background is German. I wouldn't recommend German culture or philosophy for the last two centuries to anybody. Um, mm -hmm. But we shouldn't romanticize our own culture or someone else's and pretend, you know, people can easily be, be divided into all good or all bad. That's simplistic. Um, and it doesn't do anybody any favors because then you start to miss out on the real dangers around you, including, you know, people in your own community who may be a danger to you and your tribe, so to speak. Hmm. Uh, picking up uh, on the theme of slavery, uh, if you could expand a little bit more on why it's important to study slavery as a subject mm -hmm. of human history and what this can add to how we think about it. We're, uh, I'm thinking in the context, like, were white Europeans the, the first main proponents of slavery throughout human history? And uh, Because I, I think nowadays I get the impression that if we were to ask the average person uh, what they associate slavery with, they might come up with an answer like that. But if we look at slavery in 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 the as a phenomenon of human history uh, a different picture emerges from from that uh, much longer view indeed uh, and one of the authors in the 1867 project marjorie gann who's mm -hmm. a retired school teacher has written a couple of books on slavery um has a great chapter pointing out um, that slavery was unfortunately almost ubiquitous in most human societies in history. Now, why does this matter? Because again, it speaks to the need to not romanticize, say, one culture over another. Because the more interesting question is not, you know, were most societies full of slaveholders because they were. The interesting question is how and why did it stop? And of course, it came out of a certain conception of the individual that developed in Western societies. Namely, the Christian conception of the individual. And you see this in the rhetoric, not the rhetoric, the scriptures, for example. Jesus talks about give to God what is God, Caesar what is Caesar. There's a divide right there between the state and the person. Martin Luther, you know, standing up against the Catholic Church, um, saying, here I stand, I could do no other. Assuming, you know, his assumption, his theological assumption, was that he could stand before God and communicate directly with God. Now, you can be an atheist and not believe this. What, what I'm pointing out, though, is that this conception developed the, the individual as an individual and were something in the sight of God. And abolitionists used those examples and much else and scriptural 
you know, support that, that uh, they thought they had to help abolish slavery. But it did come out of that conception. Now, why does this matter? If you say today that, yes, only Europeans held slaves and therefore, again, let's cancel European history or something, um, or, the, uh, you know, the Europeans were alone in that evil. It's it's naive. It's, in fact, anti-historical. It's anti-reality because that was not the case. I mean, you had slavery, you know, in the Arab world. You had slavery, um, you know, in East Asia, in some cases, in China. Um, you had slavery, even most people don't know this, but I wrote about it in a previous book, The Victim Cult, which you referenced off the top. Um, there was actually a slave trade in white Europeans by Arab slave traders between about 1500, maybe before 1500, lasting until the late 1700s. Um, and about 1 million Europeans were captured as far north as, as England, actually, the coast of England. Arab slave traders, the Moors, would come up, capture people from places like Plymouth and take them all the way down to, um, you know, the Mediterranean, to, to what we can now call modern day Libya, Tunisia. So, mm -hmm. again, this is fascinating because it shows the prevalence of a human evil that we all agree is a human evil today. But to actually think through history and not pretend that, um, you know, you can divide people easily into good and bad. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the, the Soviet, Soviet dissident, once said, um, based on his experience in uh, the labor camps in Siberia, that um, he met people who said, you know, someone else is the problem. And if only we can eliminate that person or their, their tribe, then all will be well. And he said they didn't understand it. And even in the labor camps of Siberia, where they'd been put for, in many cases, mere political opposition to the Soviet Union, to Stalin, he said what they didn't understand, and I'm paraphrasing, is that the line, dividing line between good and evil runs through every human heart. Um, and, and by that, of course, he meant that we're all potentially evil or all potentially good or have the mixture of both. And that realization then allows you to create a civilization, create a society based on uh, not giving one person all the power, right? Lord Acton's phrase, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The American founders understood this. The English understood this, which is why with the Magna Carta going back to 1215, they basically prevented the king from stealing their property. Um, there had to be a process for taking property. These things matter in human history. They matter to Canada now. Again, we wrote the 1867 project to say, these developments, the rights of the individual, the rule of law, you can call them European or, or attribute skin color to them. But, you know, the fact that they developed in England or in some cases Europe, these, you know, these uh, enlightenment concepts, especially in the case of Europe, has nothing to do with skin color. They just happen to be great ideas. And so today in Canada, what we need to do is reunite people around laudable ideas instead of dividing around identities, which is a very prevalent phenomenon, as you know, in Canada and in other parts of uh, in the Western world these days, at least in the Anglosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, this this book that we're talking about, the 1867 Project, uh, it the name reminds me of the 1619 mm -hmm. Project. Is is that title in any way a response to to the 1619 Project? and uh, let me tie into that question mm. something that I read from chapter one of of the the 1867 project. Uh, I just need to find it here. It it had to do with the terms critical theory, critical race theory, mm. critical social justice, and I, I was wondering if uh, in your opinion, if we need to distinguish these kinds of terms from a term like critical thinking, because it seems like it could be related to the term critical thinking, but do we need to distinguish right. those terms? So a two part question on the terms that start there. Yes, I think we do. Uh, Bruce Party who's a professor of law at Queen's University in Toronto, starts off the 1867 project by describing critical theory and some of these other theories. Um, which, you know, he basically, he basically argues are, you know, philosophical, intellectual cul-de-sac. Um, but that, cause, you know, call into question whether there's any objective reality. Um, and so the problem is, you know, they're, they're teardown theories, you could say, and, and again, attribute much evil to identities, uh, you know, European or skin color or, or, or therefore and so on, you know, and are anti-capitalist and in essence, anti-Western civilization to boot. Um, so, um, Certainly, critical thinking needs to be distinguished. You know, in critical theory, I mean, it's it's about power. Uh, and again, if you believe everything is structural, as the old Marxists did, and sort of the Marxists kind of morph now into this critical theory crowd, where everything is structural, 
there's nothing that um, is objectively true, uh, and that capitalism or the West or these individual freedoms we've talked about all derive from sort of top-down imposition, and they're not organic, or there's nothing real about the rights of men and women, um, or nothing, you know, and you can create your own society by the top-down. Well, then, um, then you have to seek power, and you have to crush those who object to your, your, your program, just like the old Marxists did, right? Uh, to make your program successful. So Bruce Party goes into that in the first chapter of The Victim Cult. And it's not like critical thinking, because if you have to crush everyone below you as a critical theorist, or cancel people because, because of their association, their identity, and so on and so forth, you're not engaging in critical thinking. You're saying, I have found the truth, I have found nirvana, I have found utopia, I have found the perfect ethic to live by, and all of you must follow without question. That's not critical thinking. So on that question, yes, we need to distinguish between what's called critical theory in the universities and elsewhere and critical thinking, which uh, really should be shored up these days. And it's one of the reasons we founded the Aristotle Foundation. On the question of the 1619 Project, I was aware of it. And, um, and of course, its claim basically is that uh, the real founding of, a, a, of America was 1619 and uh, you know, it was not 1776 and that Again, like the arguments in Canada, the United States is fundamentally uh, illegitimate uh, because of the slaveholding and the rest. Um, I, I must confess, I didn't come up with the title, the 1867 Project. A friend of mine did. And she actually, when, when I was discussing with various people setting up the Aristotle Foundation for Public Policy here in Canada, um, my friend suggested something. You know, she said, why, why not call it the 1867 Project? Because you're being, you know, talking about history in part. And he said, great idea, but not for the foundation, not for a think tank. I um, said, it's too limiting, right? And I, I did want to call it after Aristotle because of, you know, the origin of democracies, uh, of democracy, at least in the West, you know, the debates about democracy and also what, what does a good life mean? Um, you know, that, that were there in ancient Greece with Aristotle and other philosophers. I wanted to name it after Aristotle. But I, I said to her, I said, thanks for the idea. I'm going to steal a little, a little bit and... Uh, Name it, you know, put it put it on the uh, the cover of our, of our first book, in part because I think it, it it it's better suited to a book title, right? Where we're discussing the origins of Canada, and what kind of Canada do we want today? Um, you know, and the project part of it, of course, really it's it's like again this oak tree example I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, you know, you, you don't you don't get an oak tree by uh, you know by wish fulfillment. You get it by watering it, by you know giving it nourishment, by giving it water, by giving it sunshine. It's kind of like a country, you know, a country to really thrive, at least one worth defending, one worth preserving, is one that grows from the seed of good ideas. And then you nourish those ideas. And then you give it water. You give it sunshine, which is actually debate. You know, should we give women the vote? Should we not give women the vote? I mean, that debate went on. But that occurred because we had the right to free expression. Uh, should minorities be given equal rights of, as individuals? Of course they should. But that was a debate that had to happen. And it happened because of free expression. So you need, and sunshine, like for an oak tree that allows it to grow uh, in a country, free expression is like sunshine. You can't grow, you can't reform without free expression. Unless we're all so brilliant and all happen to agree as 40 million Canadians, we know exactly what we want right now and there should be no debate. But that's silly and it's, of course it's not realistic. So yeah, the project part of the 1867 project comes from this notion that of course Canada is an ongoing project. It wasn't perfect in 1867, nor in 1920, nor in 1945 after the war. But a lot of people died in that war and elsewhere, um, you know, and, and throughout our history, sacrificed blood and treasure and hard work to make Canada worth something. And it is worth something. And so the 1867 project is a call to people to modesty, to value what we have, because a lot of people sacrificed to get what you and I grew up with, you know, Tyrell, um, to get us to where we are. And... Uh, it will never be perfect. Uh, I don't believe in utopias, but it is worth something, worth a lot. And that's the part of the subtitle, you know, why Canada should be cherished, not canceled. Mm -hmm. That's well said. Thank you. Uh, one of the chapters that I really enjoyed from the book was one written by Matthew Lau, mm -hmm. who, as I understand it, is a, a journalist in Canada. And financial an analyst, plus he does columns in the Financial Post. Yeah, but his, his, right. his, Thank his, you. his day yeah. job is a financial analyst in Toronto. I see. Okay. Uh, he, he wrote about, um, well, one of the questions that I formulated that I wanted to ask you based on, on reading his piece was uh, differentiating between the concepts 
an institutionally racist society and a society where some people happen to be racist or some people are racist. Uh, is Canada a, an institutionally racist society? Should we think of it in that way? It's, yeah, it's a question that, of course, yeah, as you, as you point out, Matthew addresses in the 1867 project. And I'd ask Matthew Lauder to what I'd call a Thomas Sowell type analysis on this question. Thomas Sowell being the famous American economist who now is 93, but has spent about 50, 60 years delving into this question in the American context, right? How much does racism affect economic outcomes and other outcomes? Or does it? And, um, you know, the short answer that Sowell would give, if, if I can paraphrase, is that, you know, racism has existed in American history, obviously, including institutional racism. Um, but it's not been as determinative as you would think. So even before the civil rights reforms of the 1960s, black Americans were progressing. They were getting, you know, higher education. Um, they were coming out of poverty at greater rates. Um, even before discrimination stopped, which means other factors matter to outcomes, not just racism. So the question today, and this is what Matthew examined in the Canadian context, and the question to, to examine the question today is Canada systemically or institutionally racist, to, to which a lot of people say yes, and I, I, I think unthinkingly so. Um, they're not distinguishing between actual systemic institutional racism and you know an individual bigot that you can meet out there. The difference is quite clear. 100 years ago in San Francisco, if you were Chinese, which is, you know, Matt Lau's ancestry, you know, in, but, you know, from Canada now, obviously, um, but 100 years ago, if you were Chinese in San Francisco, you were not allowed into white hospitals. If you were Jewish in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, there were limits on your participation in Ivy League universities in Canada and probably the, uh, in the U.S. and probably Canada, I would think, places like McGill. Um, so that was institutional systemic racism. But it began to be torn apart starting in the 1950s. Ontario, for example, started to pass laws against discrimination based on gender, based on color in the early 1950s. 1950s. You could no longer, after 1951, 1952, depending on the legislation, tell someone who's black or tell someone who's a woman, you can't stay at this hotel. You could before. That was systemic institutional racism. An actual institution could discriminate against you. So it's important to make that distinction. Because if you don't, then you see a difference in outcomes today and you, you, you still think somehow there's this massive hidden racism out there, which is the accusation. When people don't define stuff and they're sloppy, then you get sloppy thinking. And a good, a good example is, again, indigenous incomes in Canada. Um, indigenous incomes, on in average, are lower than other Canadians. Is that due to systemic racism? There may be some, you know, races. There certainly is some personal racism out there still. I would, I would, I would garner. I would say, look in the internet, you can find it. But um, if you look, if you do an apples to apples comparison of Indigenous Canadians, say between the ages of 25 and 34, and other Canadians not Indigenous, if you do an apples to apples comparison, young adults, 25 to 34, uh, full time job, uh, sort of bachelor's degree, full time job, work full year, full time. According to Statistics Canada, and this is in Matthew's chapter, there's no difference in incomes because you're doing an apple to apple comparison. Both people are, you know, both sets of people are predominantly probably in the cities, not in a rural area, so on and so forth. The reason you have differences in average incomes between, say, First Nations and other Canadians is due to a number of factors. A lower average education rate among Indigenous peoples. Um, more often um, in rural communities, First Nations are often in the middle of nowhere, right? Northern Manitoba, nor you're from Saskatchewan, right? Reserves are often far from urban locations where economic opportunities exist. So Matthew Loud does a great job of unpacking this notion that Canada is systemically racist, saying, again, you can meet a bigot, uh, but that's not the same thing as what happened 100 years ago in San Francisco or to Jews in the 1940s or if someone was black before 1951, 1952 in Ontario. So it's important to understand that because that then allows you to get to the root causes of problems today. If you want to see improvement in indigenous incomes, make sure more and more young indigenous people move close to the cities or in the cities. Make sure they have a, an education or a trade. That will boost incomes and so on and so forth. That's the remedy to say lower than average incomes today in indigenous communities, along with other things like collectivism on reserves, which is always a depression, uh, depressive to incomes, right, that we knew from the Soviet era. So those sorts of reforms are necessary. So long answer to a short question, um, Tyrell. But yes, Matthew does a great job of unpacking this question of uh, prejudice versus actual systemic racism. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I, th I thought so as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, by way of bringing our conversation to a close today, I want to uh, ask you something about one of your contributions to the 1867 project. Uh, you wrote that within two decades, over 33% of people who live in Canada will be people who were born in another country. Mm -hmm. How important is it for them and for our own children and grandchildren to know the founding ideas that anchored Canada in peace, order, and good government? I think it's very important because people may be attracted to Canada, as immigrants often are, because of opportunity, but they may not necessarily know why, right? Canada has been stable and for the most part, you know, successful and prosperous or increasingly prosperous and successful. And why, for example, the rights of someone whose skin color differs from your or mine, you know, is protected. Well, it has to do with the ideas, ideas that, you know, started in the 19th century, you know, when John Stuart Mill talks about on liberty. And he talks about the, the, necess the necessity for freedom. Uh, when Mary Wollstonecraft talks about the rights of women, you know, and we, we head towards emancipation. These are important ideas that anyone can share, regardless of skin color or ancestry or religion. And so I've got a friend who came from Nigeria 20 years ago, Chuma, and he says, look, um, it's no secret that Nigeria has a huge problem with corruption. And so, you know, if you want to understand why, you know, Canada is less corrupt, it has something to do with the rule of law, which is mostly respected, not entirely. The prime minister sometimes tries to skirt the rule of law, as, as does Donald Trump down in the south, south of Canada. Um, they both try and skip over the rule of law for their own political advantages some days. Um, nonetheless, in the main, the rule of law is one of the important key concepts that's part of Canada. So, um, yeah, I think it's very important that, um, you know, Canadians, whether, you know, old stock, as people used to be called, or, you know, those who arrived from, I don't know, Hong Kong 20 years ago, or Ukraine two months ago, you know, or Nigeria 20 years ago, like my friend, we want to unite around laudable ideas. That's the key to a successful nation state. Um, if you have the right ideas, and the right ideas, I think, are the rule of law, you know, the rights of the individual, not treating people differently and based on, you know, any characteristic, but treating them equal in law and policy. Um, you know, I, I would add free markets to the list, this sort of thing. There's a number of things you want if you want to be a free, flourishing country, where frankly, in the, to use the psychological term, people can become self-actualized, where they can pursue whatever career they'd like. Um, and they're not held down by, you know, some some law that says you're the wrong skin color, you can't get this job, or you're the wrong gender, and so on and so forth. And so I think it's very important for Canadians to rediscover these concepts. And especially, again, if, if one is new here, people may, may not grasp, um, you know, what made Canada the success story that, that it mostly is, though I think some of that's under attack today. So in the last part of, of the 1867 project, I do try and, and tie it together by saying, look, Everyone is diverse as, you know, Pierre Trudeau, who was wrong in the economy, wrong in foreign policy, in my view, to, you know, Wilfrid Laurier a century earlier, you know, and others in our history, agreed in some of the, some of the fundamentals um, of what Canada should be. And it has to do with laudable ideas from the British classical liberal tradition. Again, when you think of the importance of the individual, which is um, pretty rare in human history, right? Most people in human history lived under regimes, lived under governments that treated them according to something other than their rights as an individual in that society. There was no conception of that. And so to get away from that, as we did in Western societies anyway, in the last 500 years, and in, in the Anglosphere in particular, is laudable. And it, that should be rediscovered because it gives people, I think, the potential to flourish. Right. Uh, so the 1867 project, it came out last year. Uh, by, by way of closing, could you say a word about how people have received this book and, and uh, how you think uh, uh, what, what, how, how people are talking about it in Canadian society and also how if, if people are interested in keeping up to date with what you're working on and what the Aristotle Foundation is doing, uh, how can they stay up to date with those things? Sure. Well, um, the 1867 project has done phenomenally well. It exceeded our expectations. So we were trying to get it out last spring and there you were know, delays and 
um, you know, getting it on Amazon, getting it into some bookstores across the country. At the end of the day, we managed to launch it in mid-June, uh, two weeks before Canada Day. That turned out to be serendipitous. It was a wonderful coincidence um, because what it did is it gave the focus to what do we want Canada to be like? Should we really cancel July 1st? Should we really not, you know, celebrate our history? So it turned out to make it a topic of discussion. So we got some great coverage, you know, in the National Post, for example. There's two reviews there and five excerpts, and I probably did 30 interviews at the time. But what it did is it, it made it onto the charts, helped it make it onto the charts. So it shot to number one in Amazon as of July 1st. Um, you know, what is it, eight months later now, it's still a bestseller. So for a Canadian book in history, it's sold about 9,000 copies, which, you know, for those who don't know in the context, usually I used to be told 5,000 books in Canada was a bestseller. Um, it's probably less than that now because people don't read as much. So it's done phenomenally well. We're very proud of the progress um, and the impact that it's had. And if people want to get a copy, they can go to Amazon or the local bookstore in Canada, find it there. And to keep up with the Aristotle Foundation work, uh, we do a lot of similar work uh, at the Aristotle Foundation in terms of commentary and research that we publish. Uh, just aristotlefoundation.org is the best way to uh, to find us aristotlefoundation.org and uh, yeah in the book itself 1867 project is profiled a bit there but it's also available like i said in bookstores and on amazon in canada well, thank you very much mark it's uh, been a pleasure to speak with you today thank you tyrell